Okay, Gary, thank you very much. That's a wonderful talk. And thank you, Anna, as well. So <clears throat> I have one question. It's got three bits to it. The first one is, um, the main question is, how do we, as animal rights activists, um, get other activists to come with us and work with us? How do we get the body politics to change? How do we get the public? How, what is our strategy, or our best way, our ways for bringing all them, them about, those three different parties, if you like? Well, I, I it, it's going to be a long road, but I think if everybody who's thought about this and come to this sort of conclusion, really focused on their individual responsibility, to talk to people in their own sphere of influence, their own acquaintance, even their own family, although families can be different, about this issue. Because until we get a, a mass of people who understand the principles and the underlying ideas behind the way we talk about veganism, you're never going to get politicians and legislators um, and courts to come along with you. I mean, we're both lawyers, you know, we tried it in the courts. You can tinker <laughs> around the edges, but then you find yourself arguing for very strange positions because you can only argue for what the law will permit. So it's, we, we haven't done the groundwork, I think. And I hope that organizations will, will come to this way of thinking too. But there's such a, there's, there are structural reasons as Gary was talking, about before why why this the welfare you know uh, one campaign after another without a context well that's their their bread and vegan butter you know it just they need a problem that they need the person to fix it they need support you know send us your money or whatever or write this letter and we'll do it for you that that i don't know how we ever smash that and quite honestly they're going to be continuing to do that, that, you know, there's still people doing fur campaigns and stuff like that. I think the general population has to see, one, it's their obligation to do it, and secondly, that it's possible. Because I get people talking to me all the time saying, I'm really um, disheartened because it's not working. Nobody, you know, I have hardly any vegans in my circle of acquaintance, so obviously I'm not having an effect. But then if I have a chance to talk to them for a few moments, I'm realizing they're not preparing themselves. They're not willing to put themselves in a slightly uncomfortable position, perhaps if they're not used to public speaking. They're not willing, they haven't done enough homework to really work out a simple way to explain these ideas so that if someone asks them a question, they're ready with the answer. And there's nothing wrong with you know, preparing a bit of an answer. It doesn't have to be wrote. You can go back and forth with somebody. But you Recording have to in progress. You... I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. I thought it was someone else. You know, when we wrote um, Eat Like You Care, in the back of that book, I think there are 30 questions, something like that, 25 or 30 questions. And if you've been doing this for a while, as I'm sure most of you have, you'll probably laugh if you look at them because it's a story of your life in those questions. Everybody's been asked about plants and, and what God wants and all this sort of thing. You can anticipate, you know, six of the 10 questions that you'll get over the dinner party discussion. So you need to be ready with an answer. And that's, that's how I think we have an impact. I know a lot of people who are vegan because of those sorts of discussions that we've had. And, and par part of the problem, though, is we're not just fighting the people who are not vegans. We're not just engaging with them. We're engaging with the animal people who are busy. I mean, this past week, somebody sent me, I'm trying to think of it, somebody on this, because some of your names I recognize, but somebody sent me a, um, a, a, uh, uh, an essay that was written by Wayne Shutt from DX, from Direct Action Everywhere, talking about what a great guy Peter Singer is and how he really sort of um, went off the rails when he flirted with abolitionism. Now, I'm not, I've known Wayne since he was in law school, and I don't remember him ever flirting with abolitionism, but he claims he did, and he doesn't anymore because he doesn't see it as practical. Well, think about it for a second. You've got all these groups, you've got, you've got PETA, Saying that you know Bell and Evans chicken, you know, rate you know presents chicken in a whole new animal welfare context and stuff. I mean, what that's do look, 
you got all these people out there who aren't vegans. And then you got us who try to tell them you ought to be vegan. And then you've got all these animal groups saying you don't have to be vegan. As long as you are reducing suffering and giving us donations, you don't have to be vegan. So in a sense that we're not speaking with one voice. I mean, what, what's what's interesting is this was, this started in the in the 1990s. It was becoming clear that this is what was the, the the movement was going in this direction of rejecting abolitionism and 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 embracing some sort of you know welfare on steroids sort of approach. And that's why I wrote Rain Without Thunder. And at the time, Reagan and I were working very closely because we thought, um, you know, we thought that there were, um, uh, that we're getting a lot of feedback. Can you mute your microphone if you're not using it? Um, and thank you. And, um, and um, you know, we, we thought that there was a way, you know, we thought we could sort of progress by sort of focusing on this sort of stuff. But the, the, the large groups did not want to do this because it was not their business model. They were making tons of money by promoting these welfare reform campaigns and these single issue campaigns because these people want, they're, 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 they're careerists. They're in it for the long haul as making money. I mean, they want to make- we, we, as Gary mentioned, knew the people who started Peter when it was a dozen people in Ingrid's apartment. I mean, it was just a bunch of us. We had no money, but we also didn't need any money because we were doing stuff ourselves and we had a small core interest and we went and did what we could. I think quite honestly, a lot of people are a lot more frightened of Peter's influence in the early days than they are now. But I think of, of going from that with everybody paying for whatever, you know, supplies or whatever, or transport or whatever needed themselves to the multi-million dollar corporation that Peter is now with offices, you know, in various parts of the world. And in that same time, we're using more animals, as Gary said, in worse ways than we could have even thought of in the 1980s. So, hey, we've got the business model doing this and the interests of animals going the other way. So we know it doesn't work. I've watched that in my lifetime. So there's no point in trying to replicate that. And the people who are involved in that, even if they're not thinking any thought that we would think was you know, a bad thought or whatever, they may be working very hard with the full goodness of their hearts, but that they, they are wrapped up in that framework, in that paradigm. So you're gonna have to wrench them out of it or leave them where they are and do the work yourself. And that's the, the importance, but also the responsibility of our individual obligation to educate yourself, to put yourself out there. Most of the time, you know, endure a, bit of, a little bit of discomfort. Most of us don't like to do that. You know, you feel a bit silly or someone might, might make a rude comment or might, you know, yell bacon in your face or something you'll live you know you go and talk to the next person if then if you're not getting anywhere with them but the, the model that we've seen um working for the last 50 years has not worked and then you know then and then you know what happened during the 90s was we were talking about animal rights and the welfareists came along and they appropriated animal rights right. and and um so then you know when i started when I when I was like I sort of switched my language to a, talking about abolition because animal rights became meaningless. Now you got all these welfare is talking about abolition, so now I got to come up with some. I'm, wor I'm working on a new term because I mean it's just like come on, you know, it's like it's like whenever you try to try to make an idea clear, these people come in and they muddy things up. And and but they've got a, they've got a financial interest in doing so. You know, as Anna said, when we first started with PETA in the early 1980s, it was a small group. And it was, I think, in many ways, the establishment or whatever you want to call it was much more frightened of a small group right. of us back then um, when PETA was basically run out of In Ingrid. And Ingrid started it with a guy named Alex Pacheco. They were together at the time and it ran out of their apartment I mean, in Tacoma Park, D.C., um and and it was great and you know we were we were out there you know we were doing some really interesting things and then as Peter got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger you know it became you know they started they they started selling out all sorts of 
you know, they started selling out animal interests in all sorts of ways. And then, you know, what became revolutionary was I'd rather go naked than wear fur. I, I still remember the meeting where we, we had this discussion and Ingrid announced that this was the, was the, the, the way we were going to go. And I, I, and I, Ingrid and I had a huge fight, one of many that we had over the years. But um, Ingrid and I had a huge fight about that. Because I said this is this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, so you're, we're gonna we're gonna get people to go. You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna change the world by having, you know, women running around, you know, with lettuce leaves on their breasts or something. I mean, I, I mean, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Um, but anyway, so yeah, more questions. More I, I, Dennis, you should call. Him, I I I call him people. I don't know. You know, I mean, you want me to call him people? I'll call him people. I don't care. Hey Gary, how are you doing? I'm fine. Who's who's talking? It's me, Sunny. Oh, oh, Sunny, where are you? Okay, hi. How you doing? Your picture. I'm not getting. I can't see you. How you doing, Sunny? I'm here hiding behind the camera. It's dark. Oh, there here. you are. Okay, good, okay. There you are. There you are. So you. I. So first of all, I, I want to say hi to you and Anna, and then also hi to Vanda, Jeffrey, Nagraj, and Jeremy. Uh, you know all these people. I know them on the Facebook, but I haven't met them in real life. How do you know they exist? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw them on the on the video camera and they move a little bit, so I I, I guess they exist. <laughs> so my question is, uh, you know, uh, Gary, uh, let's say we do a campaign where we ask all the hospitals to to go plant based. Do you think that this kind of campaign will contribute to veganism? You know, I. I, 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 the part of the problem with that is the meat and dairy industries have a lot more resources than we have. And so you see all the time, and you see this happening in the media all the time. Whenever there's any sort of push, you know, whenever any information comes out that, you know, animal products are bad for you, um, then all of a sudden, you know, you get some sort of pushback and people say animal products are good for you. And they come up with some, you know, there was something a few about three or four weeks ago about some article that was published in the Lancet about, you know, how like, you know, animal. Pro I mean, it's, it's I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't you know, I'm not a physician. Um, I've been a vegan for 41 years. Um, I feel better now. Um, at close to, you know, my ne the next time for me will be 70 and I feel better than I did when I was in my, you know, my twenties and I wasn't a vegan, I was just becoming a vegan. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind um, that it's healthy for you. But on the other hand, I have to be honest, it goes back to something Ronnie and I were talking about at the beginning of the, of the session. When I became a vegan, I actually thought it was harmful. I thought I would suffer health damage from it. But I decided that the health of my spirit was better, was more important than physical health. Now, it's nice that I was wrong <laughs> and, and, you know, and that, and that doing the right thing has also had a great health benefit because, you know, I feel great. Got more energy than most of the kids I teach. And they're like my, they're a, the age of my grandchildren. Uh, if I had, if I had children and grandchildren, they would be the age of this, the kids, I, the students I teach now. And I have far more energy than they do. Far, far more energy. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a doctor and I, 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 you know, I mean, it's like, I, I support, you know, like, like I, I'm all in favor of people talking about the health benefits. I'm all in favor of people talking about the, the environmental problems. But I remember there was a guy, he's not around anymore. Um, his name is Bob Torres and he had something called vegan freak. I knew Bob many years ago. I was Bob and I and Anna and Jenna, we were all, we, we used to hang out with each other. And Bob used to always, he went to law school, actually, I think. And then he disappeared. But um, uh, Bob used to always say about the environmental issue, talking about the environmental issue is like talking about whether or not the Holocaust had a bad carbon footprint. There's something very perverse about it. And I agree with that. I mean, it's like, yeah, I, I'm I'm all in favor of talking about the environmental issues because I do think there are profound environmental issues. And I think they have animal rights implications because the environment, you know, all sentient beings depend on the environment for life. And so, you know, it's not just that I'm like sort of, you know, into trees as having inherent value because I don't believe that non-sentient, I don't believe that plants or trees or whatever have any inherent value. 
I believe they have value because they are they are the homes to sentient beings. So I do think that there are environment, you know, that they're they're you know, I, I don't object to I just don't do much of it, you know. I don't I, I don't I don't want to focus on it. I think I think the 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 environmental issues I have to deal with are fairly simple. And that is the one I get all the time that I have to deal with all the time is, is, and I say, well, you know, but if we're all vegans, we wouldn't be able to feed the world. And the answer is no, it's the exact opposite. If we were all vegans, we could feed the, the, the entire world. There would be no kid going to bed hungry because, you know, the, the, the use of plants to, to produce animal foods is just tremendously inefficient. Um, One thing that I, I'm slightly encouraged about is that it seems that it must be that medical schools have a, a little bit more than the three hours that they used to teach about, <laughs> about diet yeah. um, until this generation of doctors, because you are encountering uh, doctors who don't have conniptions if you say that you're vegan, um, who will at least engage you on that or say, oh, well, that's a good thing, even if they're not vegan. And um, and you know, we'll, we'll look at you in that context. I think that's another reason why it's very helpful for individuals to be doing the education. Because if you're talking to someone in your acquaintance and they realize that you're a fully functioning, energetic, sensible person who's you're not, not dead. fragile, <laughs> dead, can't get up in the morning and, you know, bones are creaking. Um, and then you say that, that you're vegan then it's sort of cut off that initial thing of, oh, can't do that. Oh, it's dangerous. It's not healthy. All, all those things, because they're presented with a healthy um, example of, of being vegan. That's another reason we have a website, which most people, perhaps if you know Gary's website, know we have the sister site of how do I go vegan, uh, which I thought was a really useful enterprise. And the people who put it together did such a good job. Because if you make the decision to go vegan, you've got to eat that week and you need to be able to keep going while you're doing the little tweak. And it's not, I presume most of you are vegan. Um, it's, it's only a small tweak to your life, but it is a tweak. So you open your cupboard doors and you think food cupboard doors, what am I going to eat? So give someone seven days of, of food suggestions and little things that they can look for in the supermarket that will make their life easier so that it isn't this big transition and it doesn't consume your life and you don't have to start from scratch on every single thing I don't you know um, mill my own wheat or anything like that I'm a, I just live a normal life and I go to a lot you know regular supermarkets so yeah we eat a little differently as, as simply as possible and as unprocessed as possible but it, it, it isn't a full-time job so you can be an ordinary person who's vegan. I mean, ordinary, you know, normal isn't necessarily a quality I'm, I'm trying to pursue all the time. But in terms of fitting in, when you've made this change to your diet, yes, it works. You can have a job, you can have kids, you can help them make that change too. So my question regarding the campaigns for the hospitals, all the hospitals to go vegan was basically to have this, uh, you know, the... the in the in the in the media, the conversation that why are hospitals being forced to go go plant based, and eventually people will reach the position where they understand that the reason why we are in the hospital, uh, you know, we are getting into the hospital is because we are exploiting animals, and and then the part of the veganism kicks in, and so that's why my question was that can doing campaigns, and this I'm talking about campaigns uh, as of mass movements because there are organizations in UK which are doing some mass movement campaigns and this is one of the things which was uh, came up in my mind uh, you know so uh, yeah, I, I I don't I mean I don't object to people like sort of promoting the idea that that veganism is you know I mean I, I don't have any objection to it's I don't spend time doing that sort of thing because I'm not a physician and um i don't have any expertise in it um and and i i i don't know it's a, i mean i don't know that it's a i mean certainly it's 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 important that people understand that they don't need to eat animal products honey it is basically to create you know have this thing going on in the media that why there is a, this group of vegans who are forcing hospitals to go plant based uh you know like the, the same way, uh, you know, people, 
and I'm, I'm I completely come from the animal rights angle. I, I I'm an animal rights abolitionist vegan. I'm talking about mass campaigns, not as grassroots. Uh, what we are doing uh, right now is is doing the vegan awareness. I'm talking about on, on a mass, you know, on the mass uh, campaigns. Well, look, the pro the problem is is that um, I, I don't. Again, it's not my area of expertise, but I would. I'm always get a little nervous when I hear vegan people say that if you eat any animal products at all, you're going to die. I mean, the reality is you probably could eat some level of animal products and still be a reasonably healthy person. And I always get a little nervous when I hear people say, if you have any animal products at all, it's going to create a disease process. I mean, I don't know if that's true. I mean, you know, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. Um, my, I mean, common sense tells me that if you're eating plant-based potato chips and all sorts of, you know, fried stuff and, and, and you know, harmful stuff, um, even if it's all, you know, plant-based, um, that a, you know, that, that somebody who's eating all plant-based cupcakes and potato chips and stuff like that is probably less healthy. I'm just remembering your initial vegan diet. Yeah, well, my initial vegan, we don't want to talk about my initial vegan diet back, back then. Cigarettes, coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, I mean, I had a very unhealthy, we're not going to talk about that. Stop that. Um, I had a very unhealthy vegan diet when I first became a vegan. Um, I mean, I, I took the position tobacco was, you know, it was a plant, but, um, but, but anyway, um, and so, uh, um, I think that, you know, it's not a battle that we can, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't, I, telling people, if you eat any animal products, um, you're going to die or you're going to get sick strikes me as just bullshit. It's just wrong. Because as I say, you can have somebody who eats cupcakes and potato chips, um, and somebody who eats plants 95% of the time, but 5% of the time eats meat or dairy or something like that. I mean, who's healthier? I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, uh, and I don't really, it's like not, not that those sorts of uh, things don't really appeal to me all that much. I mean, obviously, um, I mean, my position is when, when I'm, dis when I discuss this is look, I'm not a doctor. Um, it is my view that there's empirical evidence that you will be healthier if you eat a plant, if you eat only plants. However, the one thing, the only thing I need you to accept from my argument is that eating animal products is not necessary for human health. Whether or not you're going to be healthier if you're a vegan, I think you will be, but that's not necessary for my argument. My argument is you don't need to eat it. There's no, you're not you're not compromising yourself by, you know, by, by, by not eating. It's not necessary. It, you know, you will certainly be as healthy if you have a decent, you know, plant-based diet. If you eat iceberg lettuce, you won't be, but you know, on the other hand, if you, you know, eat nothing but strawberry ice cream, you won't be in good shape either. And you also weigh 6,000 pounds. So, so I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, Sonny. I mean, I, it's like, I understand, I mean, you know, you and I met at that event at, at Queen Mary's at, in London a couple of years ago, seems like a million years ago, but we met at, we met at that event that um, I was at, you were at, and Marlene uh, uh, Watson, Tara, and, and Bill, uh, and some other people were at, and, and Michael Clapp. Maddie was there. And, oh yeah, Maddie, where's Maddie? Yeah, Maddie, Maddie, Maddie was there. She's yeah. there, she's waving at you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I was, I, I see, I see Maddie's there. Hi, Maddie, how you doing? Um, at least you have your camera on. Sonny's being rude and that doesn't have his camera on. But, um, uh, but I, I think that, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of good discussion that day about. There you go. Thank you, Sonny, for cap <laughs> for capitulating to peer pressure. Um, and um, uh, there was, there was, um, you know, there were a lot. There's a lot of good discussion that day, and. And there are a lot of people who, you know, who know a lot about this much more than I know. And, you know, who say that, you know, that, that, that plant-based is much healthier. And my view is, as I said that day, I, I mean, it's probably all right, but it's not necessary for my argument. For my argument is, is that you, you won't, you don't need it. Um, you know. And I, I'm not sure that I'm, I understand the appeal of that. Heaven knows I do. Um, but um, I'm, it's so always my position, and it's been my experience, that a bad way to, to approach people on this issue is one, shouting at them, or two, asking them for money. And that's why 
Um, you know, I don't think protests and that sort of street confrontation confrontation is a good way to get people to engage in you because the people step back and can't listen. So I've got this horrible image of, you know, the local newspaper stories of the person in extremist who was denied her last hamburger, you know, when she was vulnerable and ill. So I think that's kind of what it would perhaps turn into. But as I said, I'm very encouraged by the fact that I think the medical profession is finally understanding um, that there are there, there's certainly no downside and considerable benefits to a plant-based diet. Um, and, uh, you know, more doctors and more nurses will change what's in the cafeteria. I think yeah, um, Dennis, why don't you go to the next person? Okay, I think that's uh, me. So, um, hello, Gary. Hey, Raj, how you doing? Not bad. I, Anna, uh, good talk. I've not heard that one before. But uh, Anna, I was a bit shocked when you said you don't mill your own wheat. You can't be a proper. Oh, vegan. I know. Um, I know. I'm trying to keep us. A bit of time on a Sunday afternoon, which will be dedicated to said milling, but it just yeah. gets away from me, Roger. <laughs> I, I thought you had a windmill in the backyard, like you know. Ah, so. I dream, <laughs> I dream. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to limit this to. I had a couple of things I want to talk about, but I'm going to limit this to, to one because we've taken some some time so far, and I know you get very tired, uh, uh, Gary. But um, <laughs> I, I never, want, Roger. No. I want I want to talk to you about the animal rights movement bunny rabbit ears in the sense that when you were talking to Ronnie before you were saying that you got the sense that things are probably worse now than it was certainly uh when you uh, uh wrote this for example um and uh i agree i agree with you and we've got situations now where you've got kind of rich entrepreneurs moving into the movement the um corporate uh, welfare groups seem to be stronger and more funded now than ever before. Um, I mean, one, one group is getting something like $25 million for their welfare campaigns, their corporate welfare campaigns, another, another 12 uh, million. You know, there's, there's lots and lots of millions going around, but it's all going to welfare. And these are groups that most people would regard as vegan groups. So my question is this, is it, do you think any possibility of actually getting a genuine animal rights movement in the future? I guess it's the relentless optimism that you have to have uh, to be still doing that stuff at our age, Roger. Right, right, right. <laughs> Despite the experience, you get up and you think, well, uh, you know, I'm not going to knock myself off today, so what am I going to do the rest of the day? Um, yeah, right. I mean, the fact that you still do it, Raj, the right. fact that I still do it, the fact that Ronnie Lee still does it, the fact that, I mean, I mean, we do it because, I mean, you know, actually, somebody asked me about this, this very quite a young person asked me, which is basically almost the rest of the world, but um, asked me the other day, do you think you're going to win? And I said, I don't think in those terms. Um, I, I, I think I get up in the morning and I say, what am I going to do today? And it's sort of the existential question. You know, once I decide I'm not going to kill myself, what am I going to do with the day? And I don't know, Raj. I know there are still a lot of, I know there are a lot of good people out there. I know that. I know that there are a lot of good people out there and a lot of serious people out there. The problem is the noise, the noise of the, you know, I just finished reviewing a book for Oxford uh, on effective altruism and um, which I despise. And I'm sure you do as well. Um, and the, the thrust of my, of my review was, this is a bunch of people who are complaining that they're not getting the money. They're not complaining about the fact that it's a welfareist paradigm that is dominant. It's 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 not that they want to sort of do a radical vegan abolitionist approach. They're interested, you know, they're they they're just they just they're whining about the fact they're not getting money, but they're not challenging the basic problem. They're not they're not trying to shift the the paradigm in any way. And I think that's that's part of the problem is. You're right to say, and I agree with you. I mean, the 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 I think things have gotten a lot worse in that, you know, all of these groups, all of the big corporate charities are so welfareist, it's outrageous. You have groups that are actually working with corporations like Whole Foods to develop um, you know, the supposedly humane standards of, of you know of, of exploitation and whatnot. Um, it's pretty bleak. 
having said that, there are lots of people out there who um, who are uh, who who care about this and who I do think think about it in in serious ways. What I haven't figured out in the next phase of my life is going to be. I mean, Anna and I wrote "Advocate for Animals," but you know, I'm hoping Roger that um, one of the things that happens in the next few years is that. We sit down, meaning, you know, like all of us and you and, you know, and that we we get together um, and we sort of figure out, I mean, we've been around for a long time. Um, we have a perspective. I believe we what we need, you know, I'll share one thing with you. Um, there's a group of people and I, I need to, right now they're having political upheaval, but I, I'm hoping when things calm down. There's a group of abolitionists in Turkey. They're fabulous. They don't, you know, they they do tremendous advocacy work in Turkey, and they really they they're really very effective. And they don't have any money. I mean, they basically just like you know do potlucks and stuff like that. But they're very good. And I think part of it has to do with the people who sort of run it. You know, people who are at the top are very sort of motivating people and whatnot. But we've got a lot of motivating people. I mean, it's not that there's, you know, that there's a... The, the, and that perspective and, and the, um, the the edge that they have hasn't been tamped down by the corporate welfare groups. You know, they're coming yeah. to this fresh. And it's always easier to deal with a meat eater who doesn't understand anything who comes to you fresh than someone who's been the, through the grind of the compassion, welfare, green, sustainable crap that we're being fed every single day. And where everything, all our concerns, you know, they're just polishing the edges off all our concerns and saying, that's good enough. That makes you a good person. Keep buying. And we'll tell you that, that you're okay. I mean, I'm, I'm just this morning, I heard some, some proposal, you know, on an environmental issue to do something by 2050. Yes. Aren't you sick of hearing about what we're going to do by 2050? My my lawn is or it's the first week of June. Right now, New York had the same air quality as Delhi yesterday because Eastern Canada is on fire and the smoke is coming down the East Coast. My lawn, first week of June, has got big cracks in it. You know, it looks like a dried out riverbed. This is the first week of June, and we're talking about 2050, we'll do something. So we're, we're, we're being fed this, it's all right, and government will take care of stuff. When has government ever taken care of stuff that's in our general interest with the energy and the sort of focus that we're going to need? So the bottom line, Raj, is, yeah, I think it's possible. I think it's very difficult. But you know what? We have an obligation. <clears throat> we have an obligation to do it. And I'm not sure that you or I really have a choice because we keep doing it. And um, I think the only question is to try to figure out better ways of doing it. But um, but yeah, I think I think I think I think it is. I mean, I. The thing that, that turns me on, that keeps me going, is the fact that, you know, I get swamped with emails every week. I mean, I can't even keep, I I, I stopped trying to keep up with them. But I mean, I I, I get swamped people who, who like listen to some thing I did on YouTube or some talk I get. And they say, I never thought about it that way. And the answer is, you know what? We can get these ideas out there. These are, it's not rocket science, you know? I mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, part of the problem is, the ideas are pretty simple. What we, what you and I and other people spend our lives doing is cutting through the bullshit, <laughs> the welfare. I mean, it's like it's like I can't believe like I I actually spent like several days arguing with the, what the hell's his name, uh, the guy who does the reducitarian stuff, Brian Cateman. Mm -hmm. I spent several days dealing with his nonsense because he was saying that you can't really be a vegan if you walk because if you walk you kill insects, and I was trying to explain to him. <laughs> <laughs> trying to explain how absurd that is. But the, the problem is, is that you got somebody out there who's who's that, you know, who's who's talking about that buffoonish stuff, but he's being supported by people like Singer and 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 many of the quote leaders in the you know the animal community support this reducitarian stuff. And then you got this guy saying, well, you can't really be a vegan because if you walk, you step on bugs, and therefore, you know, there's no difference between stepping on a bug and eating a hamburger. And you say, no, 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 Brian, there really are differences. Let me explain them to you. And he's just, you know, he's this smug little character 
who is, you know, who's making a lot of money. I mean, he's, he's doing, he's making, he's making good living with this reducitarian stuff. Um, and, and, you know, we need to, you know, the, the problem is, is we got, you know, we end up having to deal with, I know I do, you do. We have both of us for decades spent our lives trying to sort of fight against the nonsense that that you know it, it it's not that it's not the, the 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 sort of the overt animal exploit it's the animal people you know it's you know you end up spending much of your life dealing with you know i mean i end up spending a lot of my time dealing with people who say yeah but i, I went to whole foods and and i bought level three chicken <laughs> whatever the hell they buy you know they buy they have these five grades of compassionate exploitation you or whatever the level you, 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 you choose the level of torture you can you want it, it is it, it, you know there, there's there's one there's one raj right by my house about less than a mile from my house there's a whole foods the big meat and, section and it's a huge meat section you go in there they've got like the five the five stage you know like like you can you can if you're really willing to pay extra money you can buy animals that have been raised and slaughtered on the same farm and you can buy ones that you know that have been you know that have watched you know uh, classical movies that you know I mean you know I, I mean it's nonsense and the great banner and, a serving of compassion on every yes place. a serving of compassion on every place and the problem is is that the animal people yeah. Our supposed colleagues, Raj, are busy promoting that stuff. That's the that's the problem. The problem is is that you know, is that it's hard to be arguing. Um, well, like, if not, you're a purist. Yeah, you're, you're a purist. There's, you know, uh, yeah, not realistic yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah, animal liberation now, he says. Um, and so, so it yeah, worked the last fifty years. So why is it going to work now? Yeah, but you know, so I I think yeah, I think the answer is we've got to do it. We don't have a choice. And I think in certain ways. Um, we've at least got a perspective. We've been doing this a long time. Um, both of us are, are, uh, are, and other people here, you know, we know that this is nonsense and this isn't going to work, but I do think it is possible. Um, I, I think it's possible and I think we need, and I think we need to do it. And I'm well, hoping- Well, Gary, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad that you remain optimistic and it's what I try to do as well, but there are some troubling things. I mean, Singer was in the Australian um, promoting reducitarianism. Um, Tobias Leonard's book was, um, you know, preface was by Singer. And believe it or not, there's, there's new YouTubers who kind of out Leonard Leonard now to the extent. So people who don't know who Tobias Leonard is, he's the guy who says that, if you eat fishes or cookies with eggs in, as far as he's concerned, you're you're a vegan. Right. And so you've got people now online claiming that if you oppose punching a cow in the face, that makes you a vegan. I mean, and, and so there there is quite a lot of um, you know, people are getting really tuned into this this kind of reduced, slimmed down version of just about everything, whether we talk about animal rights or veganism. And so that's that's a bit troubling, but I do agree with you, of course, that we're going to carry on. There's nothing else to do. I mean, what I, I, I'm hoping, I've been talking to the people in Turkey because I really I respect them. They're they're terrific, and um, I want to I want to write something which sort of talks about the model that they're using and see if, see if we can use it in other places. But but you know, we'll we'll continue the discussion, Roger, because <laughs> neither of us has a choice. <laughs> we just have to figure out what the hell we do. But I I I, I agree. It's it's terribly troubling. And and you know, I mean, I I um I, I remember you know uh, I don't know whether Tobias Leinhardt is still with Melanie. You know whether he's still a business partner of Melanie Joy. But you know I I um. I remember uh, when Melanie Joy's book came out, she asked, I was doing podcasts and I'm starting, I'm going to start doing my podcast again. And I was doing podcasts and Melanie Joy um, asked to come on my podcast. And I said, sure. And I sent her a list of questions and then she, she proceeded to withdraw from, <laughs> um, from, from uh, doing the podcast with me. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, I think, you know, um, I think we've got a clearer message, Roger, and um, the fact that there are people who represent themselves as animal people who think that who who, who have a pro exploitation me uh, message, let them have it. I mean, you know, we have to do what we have to do, Roger, and that's what we're going to end up. That's what we're both going to end up doing. <laughs> we have to do what we're going to do. Next person is that Louise. Louise, how are you? Hello. 
Hi, 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 Anna. Hi, Gary. Um, I'm dining in here with Chase. How how is Chase? How is oh, Chase? Oh, look at that face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's um he's doing well. He's settling in. Thank you. Ah. Oh. Um. So I I just had um a couple of questions really. Um, one was just um around well they're, they're related to two very different things. So one was just following on from something Roger was saying. And the other one was about Martha Nussbaum. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Martha Nussbaum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm um, I'm doing I'm currently doing a PhD in health economics, and it's through the lens. It's about human health and well-being, and through the lens of the capabilities approach. So I've done quite a lot of reading about you know SENS capabilities approach and Nussbaum. And um, and that has obviously led me, obviously I've been very interested in the stuff that she's um, written about animals. And in particular, I think she wrote a book uh, back in 2004, um, Frontiers of Justice. And yep. that was, I mean, she said all this like brilliant radical stuff about, you know, people with disabilities and um, non-human animals. And then, and then kind of came to this, started to, she seemed to draw on, completely contradict her own arguments and, and draw on welfareism, as far as I could see. I mean, maybe I might have misinterpreted it, but as far as I can see, drew on welfareism to, um, to then justify eating animals. And again, I, I had hoped that she'd maybe changed her mind and reflected on well, it and been this, but no, no, she hasn't. And I, so I, I have tried to um, ask her about her, you know, arguments um because i just to understand where she's coming from because it just does not add up to me um i've not been able to kind of you know when you go to some of these q and a's and obviously they have people who take your question and then interpret it and then ask the the mm. the person who's being questioned so and i've never managed to get my question worded the way i want it to be worded as to martha <laughs> it, it, really, it really wouldn't matter because martha would just change it to be what she wanted it to i mean um <laughs> I, just, I, I have to tell you, i have to tell you this is this is from her most recent book in which she claims that i am in favor oh. of mass this is a quote francione uh, by mass involuntary worldwide sterilization movement that would involve some centralized ministry rounding up all existing dogs and cats, taking them from their homes and neutering them, rather in the way that in India, under the emergency, Sanjay Gandhi arranged for members of the lower caste to be rounded up and forcibly sterilized. Now, I don't know where dear, or anything. I don't know where dear Martha got that <laughs> bullshit from. No. Um, That's but, very shocking that someone with a, her reputation would write that, actually. You know, yeah. I mean, I know because of people consider that Gary's out there, you know, on this abolitionist uh, position that that makes them apparently fair, him fair game. But that's I found that when I saw that actually quite shocking that someone with a good academic uh, reputation would write that. Yeah, I mean, Martha, look, I. I if you take Martha Nussbaum seriously, then I'm glad one of us does, um, because I I I agree with you. A lot of the stuff she says about people with disabilities is great, but when she gets to animals, um, you know she she um, she she wobbles significantly. And I think actually, to be honest with you, when I saw that, and I I actually felt good about it. The fact that. The only thing that she could say in response to me is that I was in response. I was in favor of involuntary mass sterilization campaigns. I mean, much the same way that Chan Sanjay Gandhi wanted to do that to members of the lower castes in India. I mean, what what nonsense! I've never said anything anything like that. Anything, and so um, I mean, I'm not in favor of domestication, but I've also been very clear that the domestication question is one that we'll never get to. Um, as long as we're eating animals. I mean, in other words, the domestication question, you, you will confront that after we become a vegan society and somebody figures out, you know, and then we start like looking at the dog and cat question. I mean, yeah. but that that's going to come down the road. And I've never been, in, I mean, I've never, I've never said, let's round them all up and stare. I mean, I've never said anything like that. I've said, I don't favor domestication. Yeah. And, and I don't, I, I think that domestication is a form of rights violation. 
And because what you're doing is bringing, I love my dogs. If there were two dogs, I, 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 there's nobody in the world. I don't care how much you love Chase. I don't care, Louise. Um, I, I love, I love dogs more than you do. So there, um, and, and, um, and I think that, that, um, that, you know, if there were two dogs left on the planet, Anna and I would not be in favor. And we love our dogs. Our lives revolve around our dogs, but they shouldn't exist. And, and you also can't draw a line. I mean, Martha apparently thinks that there's a line you can draw between dogs and cats and cows and pigs. I mean, the bottom line is if, if domesticated animals have some sort of rights to procreate or whatever the hell these people think, you can't draw the line. And, you know, I mean, because cows and pigs and chickens have to have that, that, that right as well. So therefore you never get rid of anything. And, and I, you know, I, I, I think, Part of the thing that, you know, it's been disturbing to me is the cheap shots that have been taken because Will Kimlock has done this too, to some degree. And the people who write in Will Kimlock's tradition, they accuse me of being, you know, of being ableist because they say that I'm, I'm opposed to domestication because I, uh, because I think human dependency is bad. No, that's not what I've said. I mean, we spend a lot of money. We ought to spend more, but we spend a lot of money in helping disabled people be as independent as possible. And the idea that we are bringing, I mean, I, I think there is, I think there are issues. I mean, how, how you come out on them is a different matter, but I do think there are moral issues about if I know with substantial certainty that I'm going to produce a disabled child, if I have a child, there's a moral question about as to whether or not I should engage in procreation. I mean, how you come out on that is a different matter, but I do think that there's a moral question there. And I I think that the idea that that, you know, I mean, I, the idea that we are bringing submissive, perpetually submissive, subservient beings into existence um, to serve whatever purposes we want them to serve, some benign, some you know, mostly non-benign, mostly not benign, you know, at all. I mean, I, I mean, here's my, our, our, our little, our, our smallest dog. This is Maya. Um, and I love Maya. She's a lovely dog. She's 16 years old this year. She's she, her mother was she came out of a puppy mill. Her mom was in a puppy mill, was removed from the puppy mill, and she was born the next day. And um, and so we adore her. She's a lovely dog. She shouldn't exist. Um, and um, I'm sorry to say that, but you shouldn't. <laughs> and um, and the idea that we're bringing submissive, subservient beings into existence for any purposes just strikes me as being wrong. But I mean. I'm not in favor of mass sterility. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not arguing that we ought to round them up and engage in you know sterilization. I'm just not. And I just wondered whether you'd managed to engage Martha Nussbaum in any discussion over the years about her views on um, eating animals, and if you've managed to like if you've actually had that direct discussion with her. I'm just curious to know what what she um, would say. What what I found, um, academics as a group are cowards and do not engage. I mean, I mean, um, Singer is a perfect example. Um, people have tried to set up debates. I mean, we, he and I debated at a medical school mm -hmm. together 25 years ago, and um, he has not debated me since. Now. I I mean the that debate focused on self awareness. I mean his position was is that if you weren't self aware, killing you wasn't a harm, and I thought that was absurd. And we argued about it. We argued about it for a, quite a while, uh, and it got it, you know it was respectful, and nobody said anything abusive, but it was certainly an animated discussion. Um, but he does his very best, uh, and you can see it if you look in a table of contents or an index. He he avoids. Tom Reagan and Gary. Yeah, Gary's he, he, avo he, he avoids. He doesn't deal with it. I mean, he avoids us in the same way that he avoided, um, you know, the only person, maybe Roger and Ronnie are familiar with this because they're the only people who would know this stuff. But um, there was a woman in the 60s. Her name was Bridget Brophy. She was, as far as I'm concerned, she was, she was the person in the 60s who had it right. Everybody else had it wrong. Um, she wasn't a philosopher. She had studied um, she had studied classics at St. Hughes in Oxford until they threw her out because she was bisexual and she drank a lot. And um, and she wrote novels. You knew her, right? You knew her, didn't you, Ronnie? Ronnie, did you know her? 
We're not hearing you. You're on mute, Ronnie. No, I didn't know. I did, didn't know her personally. I, I, I read some of the stuff she wrote uh, back she, in the Senate. I she did. Know. She did. You know, but she did an essay in '65 in the Times on Sunday called "The Rights of Animals." It's the best remarkable. thing. Remarkable. It's just remarkable. It was. But you know, she was a woman. She was a non-conventional woman. I mean, maybe today by today's standards, she'd be. But you know, she was like you know, she was. She was out there. It was the '60s. It was London. And um and and um uh. But, you know, these guys, the people who control academia, they're, they're really, you know, they're, they're, they get where they get because they have, you know, they're, 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 they're shills for, you know, the, the, the establishment. I mean, um, uh, Martha Nussbaum's partner, I don't think she's with him anymore, but a guy named Cass Sunstein and Cass Sunstein reviewed my my introduction to animal rights in the national Re no was it the national review no it was um new Re new republic I, I in some magazine he reviewed my book and completely misrepresented what i said and and i had you know i actually responded to him in in the university of chicago in a university of chicago uh symposium um but you know uh I, you would think I always thought the whole point of tenure was you had a permanent contract. They could never get rid of you unless, you know, you, you could say what you wanted to say, that tenure was the protection. I find most academics are remarkably cowardly and um, and they also will not engage people who um, who uh, disagree with them. So Singer, you know, Singer never really engaged Tom that much. He doesn't engage me. Um, Martha, I've had. I've 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 gone back and forth with Martha privately, but we've never, you know, but, but that's been very slight and it hasn't been for years. I mean, there was there was something she did a few years, uh, well, more than a few years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And um, it was some online thing and I was participating and she went out of her way not to, you know, I was trying to get her to say, on what ground can we justify continuing to eat animals? And she just wouldn't deal with it. Um, and um uh and I actually I actually went, I was at a symposium at the University of Chicago that the Law Review put on, and I was responding to Cass's re review of my book. And the paper I gave was criticized, was explaining why Cass had gotten me wrong. Cass didn't even show up at the event. He didn't even, nobody saw him all weekend long. So I mean, this is, I mean, um, I, I think to some degree, I mean, I hate to say this, um, but I do think that um most academics really are in the pocket of I don't know I don't know what they get and I'm not, I don't want to suggest that they that there's any sort of direct relationship um but um but I I I don't know I mean I I certainly am bewildered by the you know I mean it may be just that there are people who want to keep on eating animals and they want you know so they you know, I, I just don't know, but um, I, I I do know though that academia is very protect. I mean, it's it's very hard. For example, if you criticize Peter Singer, um, you try. You know, you find very very quickly that people get very defensive if you criticize Singer. Now, why is that? And the answer is, I don't know. I think it may be because Singer makes them feel that as long as they care and they, you know, that they eat one less meal a week, they're really, you know, they can pat themselves on the back and say that they're doing a good job. And, and I think that people like that, you know, I, I think that, I think that, you know, Peter Singer and Martha Nussbaum and Cass Sunstein, all these people give people excuses, you know, they, they make, they give people excuses and people want, and this is goes to, you know, something, you know, I was Rogers raising, you know, he's, saying, you know, what do we do in the face of, you know, people who just generate these excuses endlessly? And the answer is, I don't know, except I know that they're wrong. I know why they're wrong. Yeah. And I'm going to keep on saying that they're wrong until I die. Well, just on that, I wonder if I might just squeeze in another question that I was just following on from what Rod just said very quickly, um, which is, um, I know you talk about not um, asking people for money. If, however, um, we were as an abolitionist, you know, group of abolitionists 
to um, set ourselves up and say get grant funding and all kinds of things in order to promote abolitionist messages to a mass audience so you know to change the narrative so a bit like go vegan world do you know with their big uh, big billboards so it's it's an abolitionist message um but it's to a mass audience so because I just feel like, you know, there's there's all of this power, um, you know, in the hands of, of people who have, you know, who are able to like to tell the population anything, you know, and it kind of goes in. Yeah, but, 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 but Louise, whatever you do, they got a bigger megaphone. You know, I mean, that's the problem. And you, and you, and yeah. The whole world, world of grants, then you're getting into the very, you know. Because they won't allow you. Who are you going to raise the money from? I mean, the mm. problems that we have. I understand. I understand the appeal of what you're saying because mm. we need, uh, uh, you know, to amplify our own megaphone here. But um, it, the problem is not a problem a shortage of money. Money never has been. Yeah. The, the the movement, such as it is, is a wash in money. If we added up the amount <laughs> of money that people donate, usually thinking that they're doing the right thing, whether mm. it's dog and cats issues or something like the. ASPCA here that um what does the person make almost a million right he's making nine hundred thousand nine hundred thousand dollars a year salary that's what he's showing so you know it's actually more than that um there's, there's just no shortage of money being thrown at this issue it's not the right ideas and it's a lack of individual responsibility I have seen I, I mean I have seen hundreds probably thousands now of uh, tax deductible uh, charity organizations set up as I've been, you know, working through this issue over 40 years. Because because um, I, I understand it's not your, what you're talking about, but everybody wants to be the executive director of something and have mm. their own little fiefdom. And it degenerates after that into yeah. messing squabbles. So I I don't, just as the, the um, welfare model hasn't worked i don't think the charity model does either as in it can't because Absolutely. it will descend no, into no, that no, egos and spend our time on fundraisers mm -hmm. on mailings on all of that stuff all that energy that goes into um into into that um i, I will have nothing to do with it on principle people have asked us so many times why don't you set up a foundation for this that and the other it's like no, I put my money where my mouth is. I put my time where I, you know, uh, on issues that I believe in. I've never charged anybody to do an animal case. Um, and I've never taken a salary from an animal group. Now, that I, I have had options that perhaps other people don't have, but we're going to need to be extricating everything out of the time and the energy and the qualities and the expertise that we have. One thing I think we do need, and it's a huge topic, so I, I, I don't need to um, demand much time to talk about it, but we need to be getting some backbone. I think it's a, I think it's a deliberate um, attempt to, to tell us all that we can't cope with anything, that we're fragile, that we're triggered by everything, that we can't engage with tough ideas, that we can't, we've we, we been told that we're weak and ineffective. I think that's the most dreadful message. And if you if you're working on disability issues, boy, doesn't that gall you to hear people who have every advantage and every freedom and every opportunity, you know, withdrawing into their little pathetic corners, saying, "Don't demand anything of me." When you've seen the the absolute guts of people who tackle life with so much on their plate, I have personal family experience of that. I I feel it very passionately but boy we're going to be facing some dreadful stuff soon if we're not already i mean we're about to go into another american election won't that be fun after the last one this one will be a lot worse a yeah. lot worse i mean I, and, you know and as i said the climate stuff is i have no idea if it can even be fixed but we're going to need individual people doing everything that they can plus a bit more i mean that that is to demand that you know that life reflects our values that that is a problem i mean i've seen this in the university 
you know, the idea that universities are are supposed to be, quote, safe spaces. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. I think universities are supposed to be dangerous places. I think they're supposed to be places where people go and think whatever, you know, they, they think things. This idea um, that we can't have discussion about things in universities because people are triggered or they have mental health issues. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. I think that that is, I think that is one of the most serious problems we face. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things you got to deal with in life that make, that, that are uncomfortable. And, you know, you can't just sort of go running away from them and saying, I'm triggered and I did this and that, and what, you know, you got to deal with them. And, um, and I think that's a problem. I mean, I think that that is a problem. And I think that another problem is just intellectual laziness. People don't want to read things. I mean, I write, you know, one of the reasons why I stopped, I stopped doing the podcast because I was angry. I would write something and then people would say, it's too long for me to read. Can't you do it? You know, can't you do something, you know, that I can listen to when I'm driving or running? So then, and then I start doing podcasts and then people say, do you have to make them so long? They're just too long, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying to like change the way people think about an issue. And it's like, you can't write, you know, it you, you can't be longer than a tweet because then, you know, it, you know, it overwhelms them and it can't be, you know, more than seven minutes because then they lose their attention span. And it's like, God, you know, I mean, the reality is I've, I've, I've reluctantly accepted it, but it's, it's sad to me. This book, my most recent one, it's a lovely book. <laughs> See the cover? It's very nice. Um, but that's probably the, I mean, I love that book. I put a huge amount of my, my energy into that book. And, um, and I find it distressing because I've confronted the fact people don't read, don't read books. They buy it. It sells well, actually. So, so very well. The publishers, Columbia University is very happy. I've sold a lot of books. How many people have read the goddamn thing? I don't know. How many people will you have met have actually read any edition of Animal Liberation? They don't know what Peter Singer says. Yeah, I mean, they're they've looked at the gory pictures. They've been horrified. They think, oh, please, somebody do something about that. So they'll be happy with a welfare solution for it being proposed. They haven't read it. They don't know what he says about animals. And what's truly scary, they don't know what he says about humans. Yeah, I mean, his views about disability disabled people. And in the human context, yeah. oh my goodness! I mean, I mean, you, you know, the number of times, Louise. If I had five cents for every time I've said Peter Singer does not believe in animal rights, right? He doesn't, right? Said, no. And say, do, do you have animal liberation? Yeah. Have you read Animal Liberation? Well, a little bit of it. I said, read it. He says, I'm a utilitarian. I don't believe in rights. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, people just don't know, yeah. but I want to say one thing, you know, when I wrote rain without thunder, it was published in 96 by 97, nobody was talking to me anymore because people got upset with the book. It was and actually, people were not like this. He said, I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just trying to tell them. I finished, I, I finished the book. She read it. And she said, if you publish this, no <laughs> one's ever going to speak to you again. And I said, well, why? I didn't, I'm not criticizing them personally. I'm talking about ideological things. So I went ahead and, you know, I let Temple publish it and <laughs> no, no, nobody yet. spoke to me. And so <laughs> they read it then. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it, they did. They did. People, the people in the, the, the large groups were very unhappy with it because it was basically a swipe at them. And um, and also there was it was, you know, you have to understand the history. I mean, it was at a time when Tom Reagan and I are trying to get the movement sort of to move into the rights direction and the movement's reacting very badly. And Tom ends up deciding to spend the rest of his life writing this stuff about the big tent which you know i thought was nuts um but you know because because it was it was people got very upset you know with, with the position that he and i were taking and so i sort of went off for a few years i was writing stuff i was working on another book and whatnot but nobody was i mean i wasn't part of the movement anymore nobody was inviting me to conferences and so and that was fine i was i was happy with that and then something changed and that was the internet we don't need the money. You know, I mean, I mean, we don't need the sort of money. You used to need a lot of money to communicate. The opportunity costs of communication have been dramatically decreased. Now, at the same time, it's allowed a lot of voices to come into the to, to the, the marketplace. And, and so there's a, there's a lot more voices in the marketplace. On the other hand, entry into the marketplace has been, the, the entrance fee has lowered significantly. And so... I'm not a 
a computer. Pro- I'm not a. What I want to do is try to find tap into young people who I can work with to do creative multimedia sorts of things, because that's really, you know, I've confronted the fact they don't read books as good as it is. They don't read books. Um, And I'm not going to fight that anymore, Louise. You know, it's like, I'll keep writing academic. I mean, I'm working on a thing now for, for um, I'm, I'm working on a thing now about the the newest version of animal liberation and it's, you know and it's why it's never going to work um and it it will be published in an academic thing but it you know i hope it will be i try to write clearly even when i write academic stuff um but i've also confronted the fact that this ain't going to work that i need to figure out i need to figure out a different way and that's why i want to work with people with younger people i want to work with people like roger i want to work with people like ronnie lee i mean these are you know these these are these are these people we all go way back, um, and you know, and 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 um, and I think that, um, and we've stuck with it, um, and and um, uh, and I think that you know we need to get we need to reinvigorate, uh, you know, f- figure it out, and I think that's that that for me is the challenge now. You know, is I, I've been I, I'm talking to a guy. Um, uh, you know, another professor in England um, who's at Oxford, and we're talking about, you know, maybe a multi, you know, developing a sort of a multimedia, not not technical jargon stuff, but, you know, very sort of <laughs> simple and straightforward. Um, but, but you know, it's a problem. It, it's a problem because, you know, you're, we're dealing with people who are, you know, a lot of the young people, they don't want to, you know, they're just, it's longer than a tweet they just they zone out you know and and also it's become entertainment you got to entertain them and um you know i'm all in favor of you know trying to be engaging but you know i mean you can just just entertain so much i mean it's this is not you know this is hard work and um you know it's hard work and so um so i think uh i think that's uh that's my answer to your question i'll be happy to take some other ones if there's anything else ron ronnie baby talk to me uh, Gary and Anna, yeah, great, 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 uh, great talk. Uh, a lot of e- excellent points. Um, what I want to ask you about is um, um, we, we have groups over here, and I think they're, they're in other parts of the world as well, who promote um, system change rather than individual change. There's such yeah. groups as Extinction Rebellion, then we had Animal Rebellion, they've now become Animal Rising. Um, Animal Rising have got a, a thing about not. Um, not encouraging people to become vegan, not mentioning veganism because they think that that kind of somehow does more good, uh, more harm than good. So, so what's your opinion on this kind of system change rather than individual change approach? This is, I, I would make my, my non-academic comments first. This is not, this is just complete crazy. This is like saying we're going to abandon the idea of trying to uh, teach, persuade, educate on veganism, and we're going to watch Prime Minister's Question Time this morning and think this bunch is going to change <laughs> the world in the way that I would like to do it. It's, I mean, I feel as if I'm... That's so crazy, I don't even know how to engage it. I mean, legislation, um, you know, project schemes or whatever are only put in place to reflect the lowest level of consensus that you can get on anything. Why do we think people are going to make a leap to veganism and very strong environmental positions if if their constituents don't believe it themselves and haven't been told that it's the right thing or good for them or economically sensible? Where do they get this idea that it would work? Yeah, you can't, you can't, systems change, particularly when the systems change, the system changes you're talking about would have profound impacts on individual lives. Um, Personal, require great personal change. You're not going to be able to get the system change. I mean, the idea that you're going to get a group of people who aren't vegan changing the system um 
in a way that will result in veganism is just, I mean, I don't even understand it. I don't understand it conceptually. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, we saw it as lawyers. You can, yes, you can tinker around the edges. Sometimes you can come up with a creative argument and make the law do something it really wasn't intended to do. And that's a wonderful feeling. But it, it they're minor victories. You know, the law reflects the stuff that we can all agree on. And it's not going to ever be revolutionary, is it? No. It's not designed to be revolutionary. So we gave up doing animal cases. I mean, it, it's not doing anything. It's just reinforcing the status quo. And yes, there will be the worst um, violators of that, of that framework. And that's for criminal prosecutions to deal with. Um, and but... But politicians aren't going to do this for us unless we force them. And if we can't, if you can't name 10 vegans on, on both of your hands, then how are we going to get constituent pressure onto these people? It's 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 it really is crazy. I, I don't I don't even under, I don't even understand it. When right. I, I mean when Extinction Rebellion started, I, I actually knew somebody who was involved with it at the you know at the sort of the higher level. And I was very excited because I thought it was going to be, um, I mean, I thought that the concept of it, of disruption with a very strong ideological message, and actually I thought, well, let's see what happens. That could, as long as it's nonviolent, um, let's see, let's see where it goes. And then very, very quickly, they backed off of the vegan issue. I, I think in the beginning there was there was some feeling, at least I was. I was made to believe that there was some some desire to move it in a you know, but then they started with all the regeneration and blah 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 blah. And Gail, whatever the Bradbrook was not even a vegan. Roger Halen was busy, you know, bad mouthing veganism and saying about you know, and 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 then Animal Rebellion comes along, and Animal Rebellion starts talking about systems change. And I'm thinking, you know, is this the post the this is the postmodern generation, and they. They don't like the big, they don't like, like, they don't, they don't want to talk about the big economic things like um, Marxism or, you know, I mean, they don't want to talk about the big, they don't want to talk about system change on that level. They want to talk about system change on some level that assumes the legitimacy of the system, that the system as it exists right now can be changed in some way. I mean, I mean, think about this, about this. If you think about how much money animal agriculture contributes you know, to the grand scheme. I mean, I mean, animal agriculture is a huge business. So how are we going to system change? I mean, how, particularly when the people who, who are supposedly going to make the system change are not willing to change it in their own lives. I mean, what are we talking about here? I think in many ways, this is much the same. It's, it's a flip side. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly more radical sounding, but not radical in reality side of the let's make animal exploitation more humane because if we do that we'll change the system because the lights will go on and people will see that we need to move even further and the answer is it ain't worked in the the animal welfare area it's not going to work in the quote systems change area and i think that that you know it's very convenient for these groups to say what we want is system change but we don't want change on an, we're not promoting change on an individual level. And the thing is, you know, that's like saying, that's like saying, you know, you know, you're in 1917 and, you know, um, people don't want a Bolshevik revolution, but we're going to change and we're going to have a Bolshevik revolution. The answer is if they don't want one, you ain't going to have one. <laughs> it's just that simple unless you impose it. Um, and so, you know, and, and I, I do think it, you know, if you imposed veganism on, on the public, you, you want to see people in the streets? <laughs> It'd be be a lot more than stop oil or whatever the hell, you know, I mean, it, 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 you would see a significant reaction. So I don't know, Ronnie. It's also stepping back, I think, from either knowingly or not from the individual responsibility. Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. waiting for someone else to do it for us. Yeah. And we're yeah. not willing to do it in our own lives. Yeah, I mean. So if we're not having a, co starting out from, you know, a strong core of conviction and education in your own life and then moving out, you can't just sit there and wait for someone to do it for you. I mean, the most you'll get is, you know, you might get, I mean, something happened in the United States a couple of weeks ago, which got, got quite a bit of coverage, but missed the point. Legislation doesn't work. So what happened was um, 
some people came up with a re referendum. HSUS came up with a referendum um, in California to, um, you know, to, to, to require that pigs be given more space and blah, 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 blah. And this got challenged in the Supreme Court on, on the grounds that it was affecting that it was affecting interstate commerce because it meant that people who were raising pigs in Iowa couldn't sell the pork in California because the the pork didn't comply with the with the referendum with the with the referendum requirements. And the Supreme Court said, no, you know, you it, it you can uphold it. You know, it doesn't violate the Commerce Clause. You can uphold it. And the animal people were getting orgasmal about this. If you look at what and, and the referendum actually went further than legislation normally does. But what did it do? It basically, as a compromise, allowed United Egg producers to determine how much space hens were going to have. United Egg, United Egg producers are setting the standards for hens. And you can still use a farrowing crate for pigs right before they, they give birth. And during the entire nursing period, you can use farrowing crates. The only the only change that it made was that it required that gestation crates be larger than they are now. This is this was this is the best you're going to get. <laughs> the California legis the California referendum is the best you're going to get because it wasn't strictly legislation. It wasn't dependent on the legislature. It was something that people, you know, supported, and yet it was incredibly useless. And ultimately, I think probably will increase net suffering because it makes people feel that things are, you know, that, that that animal products are being produced in a much more humane way in California. And so therefore that this is, you know, this is a good thing. And the answer is no, it's not. But, you know, we got to put heads together, Ronnie. Come on. We know we've got we've got we've got a lot of a lot of years. Yeah, a lot of years. We got to got to get some of these young people and sort of try to figure this out and what we how we take it to the next level. And it ain't systems change. It ain't systems change. Go yeah, ahead. I, I think it's a particular, uh, particular um, shame with regard to animal rising because they they do some very good nonviolent direct actions. So you've got the actions that are good, particularly the actions they take with regard to they've done a lot of stuff with regard to the dairy industry. It's got a lot of publicity and they have now started talking about um, uh, the exploitation of animals and not just about the climate crisis. So that's that's a, a good move in the right direction. Um, but what they fail to do in their messaging is encourage people as individuals to go vegan. And I think right. this is a huge wasted opportunity. They've, they've, they've got the media attention, that they've got a platform where they could do that, and yet they don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I, I it does it makes no sense and it will not result in any sort of significant change. I mean, some people will see it and you know and whatnot. And 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 then if they're told, well, you know, what what should I do in response to this? Well, pressure your legislator to stop this or something. If you don't tell them to go vegan, if you don't tell them you've got to withdraw from the system, you have to stop participating. What change do you have? Well, they'll say, well, I'm only buying from RSPCA, you know, yes. a stamped with a stamp of approval from them. What else do you want from me? You know, yeah. when we haven't told them that that is not enough and it, that it's useless. That's a fairy tale we're selling. All right. We'll take one more question. Um, and why because you've had your electronic hand up for five hours. Um, <laughs> go ahead, VEG. Hi, uh, sorry, it's uh, Graham here. Um, I couldn't get Zoom to work on my phone. Um, in the west of Ireland, uh, Wi Fi isn't too good. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, both Anna and uh, Gary, very much. Um, it was amazing to hear you speak again. Um, I had um, just a couple of questions. One yeah. would be um, from a recent experience. Um, I'd recently set up my own uh, vegan education grassroots outreach group. Yeah. And as a part of that, I started to apply to the likes of Veg Fund and the Vegan Society and any, any of these places I was recommended and got turned down by them all. Um, and apparently there was nothing wrong with the submissions. It was just um, too competitive and not enough money for grassroots. Um, so I wanted to ask your opinion on, would it, has, has it been tried before or what do you think of the feasibility of starting up a rival veg fund with the priorities and emphasis on getting grassroots um, vegan outreach groups up and running? I think the problem is whenever you're looking at money, 
you're looking at, you know, I mean, none of these organizations are particularly radical. I mean, they're just, they're just, um, uh, um, I mean, the idea that these organizations don't have, I mean, I, I, let me, let me, let me just tell you this. When I first got, when Anna and I first got involved with PETA, one of PETA's great strengths was that it had chapters all over the United States, grassroots chapters. And the first thing that they did when they got big was they closed the grassroots <laughs> chapter. Why? Because we can't have that sort of level of democracy. I mean, you know, just that just, you know, I mean, these, I, I have to tell you, um, the animal, the animal rights movement is sort of run on a model of like, you know, fascist, I mean, it's sort of fascistic. I mean, it really is it's, it's dreadful. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's centralized control and it, you know, whatever. And, and if the centralized control was trying to keep it radical, I might have more, more tolerance for it, but it's not, it's central, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, um, I, I made a decision years ago. It was the best decision I ever made. Uh, I was, a number of people, when I was a young person, a number of people tried to hire me to work for their organizations as general, be, to be general counsel and to leave academia and to go to work for the movement. And I said to all of them, I will never work for the movement ever. I will never get a paycheck from the movement because the moment I get a paycheck from the movement, you tell me what I think and I'm going to, I'm not going to have that happen. So I, I've had, you know, I've, I've been, I've been, you know, I, this is my almost 40th year as employment as a university professor. And, and, you know, and if I, and if I wanted to make more money, I just did consulting in, on legal issues, on non-animal legal issues. Um, and, or I would, you know, help write a brief or something like that. I never made any money doing this and it allowed me to be totally free to sort of like look at it and sort of about how I think. And I think that the moment you start looking to these groups for money, um, I mean, I mean, let, let me tell you, I mean, I don't know what you think about my views, but I was actually not allowed to join the vegan society <laughs> yeah. because, because I love it. Because yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I was actually, they actually turned down my application for membership <laughs> because uh, some years ago I had done a, an interview with, um, the vegan, you know, the magazine they have, they did, they did three mag, they did three issues in, 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 in a row. They interviewed singer in one Reagan in another and me in another, but I, I didn't have access to the magazines. You know, they, they just like sent me a, a you know, a copy, an electronic copy and whatnot. Um, and somebody contacted me and said, why are you doing this? Why are you working with the, the the vegan society? And I thought I thought the vegan society was okay. I didn't really know much about them. I thought this was the group that Donald Watson had started. And I I did know one person. I knew I knew um, one person in the group, and I thought she was quite good. I mean, she was she was like the sort of person I I dealt with. I forgot what her name was, but she was quite good. And so I asked to see a copy of the magazine. And I get a copy of the magazine, and there's all these ads in there for these places that are not vegan. You know, like, like, you know, spend the weekend, you know, at our inn, you know, not vegan, you know, pictures of happy cows and stuff. I was shocked. And I said, um, I wrote to them and I said, I'm very disturbed about this because I didn't know you put this crap in your magazine and, and you would take all this, you know, and I was told, well, Donald Watson uh, you know, he took ads from, you know, he took money from vegetarian organizations in 1945. I said, 1945, I said, it was this after the Second World War. Britain was still under, under, under rationing. <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, you know, whatever Donald Watson did in 1945, God bless him, but it ain't 1945 anymore. You know, and, and this is, just, and so they had an online, um, discussion group and so i posted something about i said what do you all think about this i think this is a really bad idea and everybody was supporting me and it got so bad <laughs> that they shut down the discussion group and um and then they were also um uh promoted they had some sort of campaign you don't have to be vegan to love vegan or some crap i i don't know what it was it was some it was somebody i forget what her name was uh i forget what her name was but for a while they had that was that was that what, what, yeah, yeah. yeah it was something where they were they were advert they were they were promoting really serious things like you can try this vegan lipstick even if you're not vegan i'm not kidding that was yeah one of yeah them. yeah it was it was 
Look, I understand the frust I understand the frustration because things aren't moving fast enough and you know the word isn't spreading fast enough. And, and trust me, I'm a lot older than you are and a lot closer to lights out than you are. So I understand the, the frustration. But, um, you know, I, I, a good old phrase of don't despise the days of small beginnings, because if you do a, a really good education with that group of people and, and they get they get it and they to the point where they can go and explain it to someone else. You can't really understand it unless you can explain it to someone else. You can do that. And that's the way things spread. And boy, is it frustrating that it isn't faster and you know that we don't have the sphere of influence that we'd immediately like. But I think that's a great thing to do in your own community. And then you know, keep in touch with those people and make sure that they're taking that next step and you know, work your way up <laughs> the West Coast of Ireland. You, you, don't, you don't have to have a lot of money to right. do really good work. You have to have a lot of money to pay yourself a big salary and to call yourself an executive director and to have an assistant. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, it's something you'll do in addition to your work and your family and all the other things that yeah. the pressures that we all have. But that's how change happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, but we we just need to be more creative. And we, and, we've talked about because we've been sort of spending time wrapping up a few things up recently. So we're, we're ready to tackle some new things, too. But perhaps do education, I mean, you, you know, you sound as if you're ready to go, but some people would like to do what you're planning, but aren't quite ready to go. So we've thought about doing um, the sort of discussions that we have, as Gary was mentioning, with the people in Turkey. We've, we've hooked into several of their events. They're relatively small events with potluck dinners. I think that's a good use of my time. Yeah. You know, it's not you don't have to be in a big auditorium with an audience that will give you a round of applause, but perhaps it doesn't really, you know, settle into their brains properly. You, you go and have a good, vigorous, engaged conversation with someone. You can really change their perspective. So I'd like to <laughs> keep in touch and let us know how it's going. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I we're going to we're going to be um, next year, at least um, in, in the United Kingdom. And I'm hoping I've never been to Ireland and I really hope to get over there. Um, because I've, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not huge on traveling and I've cut down dramatically for environmental reasons. I, I, I basically do, I, I do 5%. I mean, most of the talk talks, when I'm asked to give a talk, I say, can I do it virtually? And if the answer is no, I don't do it because the idea that I'm flying thousands of miles to go talk to people about not harming animals when I'm flying on an airplane, it strikes me as being sort of strange. And I don't do I, I don't I don't do it anymore. Um, I I've as I said I cut down my 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 travel by ninety five percent. And um, but I would like to go I would like to go to Ireland. I don't have to you know I I I I don't have to fly. I don't like to fly. Flying is not good. It's really bad for the environment and kills kills animals. And um, so I but I'd like to come over to Ireland um, because I think there are a lot of really fine um, Irish you know I mean I I've met a lot of. A lot, of, a lot of, I mean, I, I've done a couple of things at Trinity College. I've been really impressed um, in Dublin. Um, I've been really impressed with um, the students, some of the students that I've, I've, um, I've encountered there. Um, you know, I, I've been, I've been impressed, um, you know. Um, yeah, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I kind of have a good job and I can get a lot of printing done and stuff for in work and yeah. um, sort of excess salary I can pump into our own group and, um like uh, Roger and a couple of other groups in Ireland, they've kind of passed on some equipment and stuff and do outreach with us, which is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. But it was just um, part of what I try to do with the group is try to inspire other groups, either in Ireland or abroad, to kind of set up and do their own outreach in their own communities. Yeah. Um, and a few people that I did have interest that they were saying, oh, well, I, I can't even afford ink for my printer, let alone... So that's kind of where that one was coming from. It wasn't the likes of the, the veg fund power, but, you know, like a well, hundred quid to get something going, that sort of thing. What, um, what would be really great if you're in contact with these people is for people to know where don't, you know, giving somebody, I want to say donating, because that sounds a bit to an organization where a hundred quid would make a difference. You know, yes. it doesn't have to be charitable. It doesn't have to be tax deductible. It's like, I've got a bit spare. You could do something good with it. Give me your PayPal or bang, whatever it is. We give address. money to people all the time. We don't Just take tax deductions. Bypass the organizations. You know, it takes 
skim all the stuff that's skimmed off for administration not with what you're planning but with a lot of groups that's get sucks up so much stuff and, and it's not put into programs you know match somebody up you can change what they're doing and that someone feels really good about helping where it's needed yeah we oftentimes you know like if, like if somebody if somebody's got a really good project and you know we always say well find somebody who will match it and we'll give you x hundreds of dollars or whatever um right. You know, yeah, yeah, and we give it. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, I mean, um, you need you need to do vegan outreach, and you need to do it on a local basis because the idea that we fly people in, that we fly these movement celebrities in, you know, that we, you know, we fly in Joey Carbstrong or whatever the hell his name is, or you know, or, or you know, or or whoever these people are, um, you know, that they're flying these these people in to sort of talk to people about, I mean, it's, it's nonsense. You ought to be doing it in your own community, you know? And, and um, uh, we don't, you know, that's just not going on, you know, that's just not going on. And, you know, people, we, we send books out for reading groups. We send books out for prisons and reading groups, which is a, an important thing to do. You know, if you know someone who's got a vet bill that they can't deal with easily, if someone's really lost their job and they're, they're, they're worried about taking care of their own companion animals, that's when a few pounds can make a huge difference to someone's life. Not being put into the executive director of this, that and the other, you know, it's those are corporations. There's real people who could do great stuff with a small amount of resources, as Peter did in the early days. They were on a, a shoestring was was a a lot at that point. We gave them. We I remember we gave them. We didn't have any money. Right. We gave them two hundred dollars. The biggest contribution. And it was the biggest contribution they had gotten up to that point. <laughs> right. Um, and they were like speechless. And we had no. Literally, it was like we had. $250 in the bank. We gave them 200 so that they could put some, some um, uh, uh, posters, you know, up on buses in DC and uh, Washington, DC. And, um, you know, in those days, I got to tell you, we were making, you know, we, we were, we were having an impact. Um, and the bigger it got, the less impactful it got. The more money that came into it, the more worthless it became. Um, and and you know, and I I still remember. I I I I can still think back over specific things that happened where it was a signal to me, this ain't going in the right direction. And um, and and it all you know, it was all about money. It was all about we had to take positions to make people feel okay so that they would give us money. And um, I think that's the that's the 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 you know the, uh, the real a real problem. But anyway, it's been look it's been great, you people. Um, you know it's been terrific talking y'all. And um, thank you for having having me um, and and Anna. I only ask why you waited this long. I'm only kidding. Um, and and um, but I'd be happy to do it. Be happy to do it. Be happy to do it again. I mean you know. Um, uh, if I, if I wasn't going away tomorrow, I would, I would spend you more time to, but I got to get ready for my trip. And, um, uh, but I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping I can meet you all, or at least the Irish people, um, at some point. Um, and, uh, th thanks for having us and, uh, okay. keep, work keep working every day. Got to keep working every day. Never get tired. Never say, you know, never say die. Never, never be defeatist. You know, every day is an opportunity to make more vegans every single day is an opportunity to turn somebody on to veganism. You can do it. But um, anyway, peace. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Carry Take on. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, Ronnie. Take care, Roger. Take care, everybody. Be well.